The auto salvage industry is, it's wild. There's a whole myriad of reasons as to why things get purchased, why things get returned, the reasons they get returned, the reasons they were purchased in the first place, why those parts were deemed bad or defective, or why stuff ends up in the scenario it does. I've been in this industry for quite some time and I guess you could say I've seen a thing or two and every now and then I buy an engine to tear down because it's got good parts to sell plus I'd like a video for you guys and I, it's just a head scratcher and this is one of those engines this is a BMW N26 it's a turbo four cylinder two liter makes about 240 horsepower comes in 528s and 328s 320s some of the other four cylinder powered BMWs from that era I think starting in 11 or 12. And I've done these engines before. I've had a couple of them in. I, I typically don't buy the cars these engines come in, but I do buy the cores because the parts sell really well. And this core has, it's just strange. It's, I don't know how else to say it. The vast majority of customers in the auto salvage industry are genuine, honest people. They wouldn't do anything wrong, at least not on purpose. But every now and then some deal comes through that just smells off. It smells of tomfoolery and some frivolous activity. It kind of burns the nostrils just as much as it burns the wallet. And I think this has a tinge of that because this is an N26, which is essentially the same thing as an N20. This is just the low emission version, the California emission version. It has a few different things like the injectors are different, has an extra vacuum line, and it has a guaranteed electric electronic wastegate. But there's some, um, there's some things wrong with this engine, just right off the bat. So let's validate this is an N26, and it clearly says N26B30A. Here's some things that make you go, hmm. The turbo is not bolted down, the clamp is missing between the exhaust housing and the turbocharger. So that's obviously been a part. The bolts, some of the nuts are missing to hold the exhaust manifold to the cylinder head. I think this damage to the valve cover happened in shipping but then some of the valve cover bolts are loose, the fuel rail's loose, and I think most of this could have happened from just swapping parts around. Now, here's where it gets a little sideways. So this has a stock number on the cylinder head, which means this engine was returned, and the stock number here matches the valve cover, which matches the stock number from the yard, which meant that this engine was returned as defective. This is an engine that was sold and it came back. This is a heat tab from LKQ which means that this engine came from two cars ago. So likely the yard bought a car at the auction that had an engine that had already been replaced and the heat center of the heat tabs melted out. There's, but this stock number is still in the head and then there's the heat tab from the yard that sold it. So this engine has been in at least two different cars and the heat tabs melted out. That makes you go, hmm. That's probably the biggest sketchy part of this engine. But now, let's take it apart and figure out, is it really sketchy? It's going to be sketchy, it's a BMW. The very first thing I'd like to do is see if this engine turns over. Oh yeah. What was that? Um, I don't know what that was, but okay. Oh, it's musical. This is kind of fun. I feel like I'm in a Three Stooges short. I see what's going on here. There's no spark plugs in it. That's just the air rushing past the coils. Well, it's not locked up, which means that this whole thing will come apart just fine. That was fun. Now I'm wondering if we could tell if the compression is bad or not by the pitch of the air coming out of the spark plug tubes. Let's pull these coils out. Yep. No plugs. Since we're in the mood of pulling parts that don't require tools, let's get the rail and the fuel lines off. This is easy. The next thing I'd like to do is pull the oil filter. I didn't bring my socket today because I'm a poor planner. It wasn't that tight anyway. Oh, there's oil in there. Well, my first thought when looking in the oil filter housing is ugh. I don't see any metal, which is good, but the oil is, it's got a lot of dirt in it. 
or whatever that is. There's lots of not normal things in the oil. A quick look at the filter. I don't really see a lot of dirt. I don't see any glistening, shiny pieces of metal in here. I will say that the oil that came out of this is pretty clean. It just had some contaminants in it. So I think this engine was likely installed and then pulled back out. This engine's been through the ringer. I don't see anything that's cause for concern in this filter. Next, we're going to get the intake manifold off, which is only held on with a couple of nuts. This one's definitely been off. Is that it? That's not it. What did I miss? Another one. Well, that was simple. Well, the intake ports are actually pretty clean for one of these DI engines. They're normally a lot worse than this, so this may have been cleaned, but if you look at the difference between the two intake valves, that's kind of odd. Those two are pretty similar. A little bit of buildup. And again, there's a difference there. I don't know quite what causes that. I don't see any major problems. There's not like parts of a piston hanging out in here or a bent valve that I can easily see. Next, I need to remove the high pressure fuel pump, which for some odd reason has two different types of bolts holding it in. I don't think that's how they come. And it's off. Next, it's time to remove the valve cover. Half of these bolts are already loose, so this shouldn't be too difficult. I think that's all of them. Yes. Am I forgetting something here? Do I need to pull the vacuum pump off? I think I do. It needs to come off anyway. It's a good vacuum pump. Oh, I missed. Now oh, this will go boop right off. Boop. So the reason this may look strange if you haven't seen under the valve cover of one of these engines is this has a Valvetronic, which generally means it has a cam for the cam. So at this cam is the actual camshaft, and then there's what's called an eccentric shaft, which controls the amount of air going into the engine. The throttle body on these engines almost doesn't do anything. This controls the amount of engagement of the camshaft. That's the best way I can describe it. And looking around in here, it doesn't look too bad. It's definitely got some varnish, but I don't see any chunks of metal. I don't see any forbidden glitter. I don't see anything out of place. It all looks pretty decent, just a little dirty. And I can tell that it's had a timing guide and probably a timing chain done. In it that looks like a newer chain which is good and pretty common for these engines next i'm going to spend a little time and remove the turbocharger and that is the electric water pump we'll get that next two different bolts holding the oil drain that is also not a bmw bolt well that was uh unnecessary and the fitting is gone out of the lower oil pan that's odd and now we need to remove the oil feed Oh, fresh oil running everywhere. Oh, that's pretty much water looking. It's not water. It's just that new oil that they... 0W0. It doesn't look good. It's got a bunch of junk in it. Maybe this engine sat outside for some time. We may find some water in the pan because of the broken valve cover. So now that that's off, uh, we're going to have to pull the exhaust manifold off to get this off. That should be pretty easy. I think I got them all. Now this should just pull right off. That's easy. Let's take a look at this turbocharger. Now these are worth a little bit of money, but man, I, I don't think I could ever trust this one after the scenario it's in. And this oil line needs to be fixed like that. Okay, so it spins pretty well, it spins freely, it doesn't have, it has virtually zero shaft play, but the scenario in which this engine was, plus the fact that I can tell that the, yeah, the, the fins are bent 
from this not being installed correctly and the exhaust manifold and the engine being knocked around. So this is just a core because it's going to need a new shaft. So that is one part. Now we can remove the electric water pump. Looks like the clamp's missing off of that. Oh, it's still got coolant in it. It's pink. I don't think that's right. These things go bad pretty often. This one's got a chip connector and the impeller does not turn. So it tells me it's got problems or maybe it needs power. Either way. Um... Next, it's time to remove the injectors. So there's a tool to get these out. And at my age, I've had a lot of practice at using this tool. That's what I meant, not anything else, just using the tool. It's very easy to get these out in most cases. Those aren't really in there that well. I wonder if these are original. One difference between an N20 and an N26 are the fuel injectors. So if you swap engines between the two and you don't swap the injectors over, you will get codes for either a lean condition or a rich condition. So now I'm going to look up the part number on these to make sure these are still N26. Because that could be a reason why someone returned an engine. Yes, these are N26 fuel injectors. They all look like they're in pretty good shape, but use N20 and 26 injectors. They're not worth a whole bunch of money. They might be worth selling. Next, we'll remove these injector trays. Came out pretty easily. Now you can get a better look at the way the Valvetronic system is set up on these engines. You've got this motor right here, which turns this gear, which is part of the eccentric shaft. And then you have two sets of rockers. That controls the engagement of the cam that's driven by the timing chain. Next, we're going to go to the front of the engine. We're going to remove this fitting here, this oil cooler with the oil filter housing. Oh man, it would be terrible if I broke it. Just kidding. Oh yeah, a bunch of uh, RTV. That looks like it's supposed to be there. Not, not the fact that it has a giant O-ring on it, but the RTV is what seals it. Next, we will remove the oil filter housing. There we go. Oop, it's got a bunch of, you know, that, that doesn't really look like oil. That kind of looks like water. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's water. That's zero W zero stuff. Oil filter housing gasket needs to be replaced. They always need to be replaced. Next, we're going to go to the crank pulley, get the outer pulley off so we can have access to these plugs, which allows us to get all the timing components loose. And we're off. Next, we'll get these loose. Well, this one is already loose. Next, we'll get the tensioner removed. Oh, some of that oil came out. A little bit of debris on there, but it's not metal. Next, we'll get the timing cassette bolts out. Next, I'm going to remove the cam sensors and then these cassette bolts. Now, the Vanus gears. So the reason I removed the uh, cam sensors so that I have room to get the gears off. Now I should be able to pull this cassette out that's in multiple pieces that although it shouldn't be. Look at that. Let's see if we can find a date on it. 2022. This is practically new. This doesn't fit very good. Maybe it's not supposed to. Yeah, this is this is basically brand new. Eric, no. What? People get really mad when you do that. But who's going to use this? People who don't know any better are going to get really mad. They're going to get mad at me. Yeah, they get really mad.
It's still a used timing guide. No one's going to put this in their car. Yeah, I know. It's stupid. I don't care that it's new. Just pretend to keep it or something. Fine. So normally, I'm all about taking everything apart so that we know the condition of everything. But on a Valvetronic cylinder head, you can arrange the camshafts in a position to where you can get all the head bolts out without taking any of the Valvetronic stuff apart. And if there's no damage to any of the oiling system, we haven't seen any signs of that yet. There's no good reason to take this apart because it does devalue the cylinder head. To, for someone to have to put this back together, I end up selling this stuff for less. So we're going to try to keep it together unless we have to take it apart. So what I do is I insert this tool and then I can rotate the eccentric shaft to where it is out of the way of all of the head bolts. Just like so. And I will have to remove this one stop right here so that I can get access to that one head bolt. I'm gonna get a magnet for that one. Before we tackle the big head bolts, there's a few around the perimeter that need to come out first. What is this in here? I don't know, it's, it's gone forever now. Now it's time for the head bolts. We start with the outer four, which are T55. That one didn't seem very tight. In fact, none of these do. Now for the inner head bolts, these are the most delicate because of their size. They're T60s and you gotta go around all of the Valvetronic valve train. Mm, I'm gonna have to turn this cam over because the fuel pump lobe is blocking access to the head bolt. That's good. I do need to remove this oil supply for the Valvetronic motor. it does block my path to the final head bolt. All right, now I'm going to carefully get these out, not using my air impact. Oh, the head is loose. I'm going to rotate this a little bit up so that it's less likely to fall because I don't know what the condition of the dowels is. We're going to have to lift this one with the bolts, pull this one out, and the head should just lift right off. But it's not because of the bolts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can't get any of the bolts out. There we go. I have to fish these out and then I can pull the head. All right, I got the easy ones. Nope, let's get the magnet. All right, with one bolt left in it, it should be easy. Well, it's more easy. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, that's not good. It is now time for our test of science. That piston rocks quite a lot. But I don't think we have any broken rods. But what we do have, you guys see it? Look between the cylinders. Right there, and there, and there. That's combustion gases. They don't go there. There's supposed to be a gasket that maintains a tight seal. Let's go look at that. And it's bad. Yes siree. I think that foreshadowing when we saw that uh, heat tab, the center melted out, those melt out at a certain temperature and it's usually a good indicator if an engine's been overheated. I'd say it's a good indicator that this engine's been overheated. And the head, look at the marks on the cylinder head. I bet this head is cracked. I 
we'd be a Tibetan man on that one. And look at these boars. That got pretty spicy. Don't know what two and three look like. Won't be able to tell until we get the, the uh, engine further apart because I can't turn it over since the chain will get in a bind. Yeah, that's, that's hot. That got real hot. So at this point, there's two ways of thinking of things. I could drain it like a normal person, or I could flip it over like the Eric of the past. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling nostalgic. So we're just going to turn it over and see what comes out of it. If I make a mess, I make a mess. I've got pigment here. Oh, there's the chain. There's something from the crankcase. Yeah, that's good enough. See, look at all the time I saved myself. Next, it's time to remove the 148 oil pan bolts. Now hopefully the pan just lifts off. Usually you don't have to pry these off. Ooh, sediment. I said what I meant. There's chunks of stuff in here. Oh, it's plastic. Chunks of plastic inside a BMW engine. Never. What's weird here is that it's, it's not a lot of it. It's just a few chunks, like a, a past repair didn't get fully cleaned out. And that's kind of dangerous too, because if there's enough of it, it can sit in the uh, pickup and starve it of oil, even after the repair is made. This just looks like there was some water mixed in here. Some sludge. But I don't see any chunks of metal, which is good. And there's not a thing in the pickup screen. So that is a pretty good sign. So far, I think that this, this piece will be worth selling, worth reusing, since this looks like a classic overheat, just like the last N20 that we did. And now we got to take this off. All right, let's zip some bolts out. Did that help me in any way? I don't know. It sure doesn't feel like it. Brett, I have to get that out. That's good for the tensioner. Just, yeah, you don't need that. Oh, that just fell down. That's perfect. Yeah, we're gonna have to take that off. Hey, we got it off. I don't think that was supposed to happen. That was supposed to happen. Yeah. There we go. Well, it's really unfortunate that this, this part broke when we were working on it. Next, we'll remove the oil pump and balance cartridge. Pretty easy. Next, we're gonna turn this over so that all the rods and pistons can be unbolted. Just like so. This thing does turn over quite nice. What? Ah, so this just went from a windfall to just breaking wind. This all looks good. And, uh-oh. That bearing, that bearing's orientation is not correct, which means that the crank may have some damage. And that is one of the most expensive parts of this engine. Neat. We can still keep our fingers crossed. Now it's time to knock the rods and pistons out. Now it's time to remove the bed plate, the bottom of the block. We'll do the perimeter bolts first. Low pan gasket, that's good.
I don't really want bolts going everywhere, so I just, I gotta find a way to get all these bolts out a little bit faster. Oh, that was easy. And now for the main cap bolts. And now we can pry this out of here. Perfect. And the crank should literally just shibooby right out of there. Oh yeah, seals. Oopsies. Oh, this is, this is dumb. Hold on, hold please. I think I gotta get this crank sensor thing out of the way. There we are. This must have some magnetic thing. I'm not quite sure how this works, but this is the trigger for the crank sensor technology. Let's take a look at what we've got. We have damaged rod bearings. Not terrible, but pretty significant wear, especially on that top shell. A little bit of damage, just, just wear. I mean, on the rod bearings, that's wear. This was the one I assumed was spun because of the way it looked, and I don't think it was because it has some marks that look like the end of a bearing, and I couldn't tell that that wasn't the end of a bearing. So I think we might be okay. Let's look at the crankshaft next. Yeah, this is uh, pretty typical for an N20. These cars aren't as maintained as some of their higher trim level cars are. It's kind of a shame. Rods, pistons, not terrible. A little bit of skirt wear, but there's no valve damage. I don't see any signs of detonation or distorting. You'd see definite marks on the skirts if that were the case and the sides of the crowns. I don't see any of that. They all look pretty decent. And the crankshaft, it's gonna need a polish. There is enough, enough fine scratches that this should go to a machine shop to get polished before use, and we'll have to measure it. But I think this is a serviceable crankshaft. I don't think it's gonna need to be turned or run different size bearings. I think this crank is going to be a sellable unit, which is great. The wind has fallen. The main bearings, pretty solid. Not a lot of damage, just a little. I can tell you that I don't believe this to be a super low mileage engine, just judging by the overall wear. The bores are not so great, and I'll show you why. This got really hot. I would bet that what it would take to run this block reliably would far outweigh what this block is worth. So this may end up going to the scrap bin. I don't know if you could ever make this right for a feasible number. It's not like an old small block where you just throw it back in the machine and make them bigger. Now I wanted to clean up the cylinder head around the spark plugs and the valves to check for cracks. And I did check for cracks and while these don't look too bad, you can see right there, there's a hairline crack between the spark plug, there's a better look at it, the spark plug and the valve seat. This one's right there, it's a little more plain because I haven't scrubbed it as hard. I know you shouldn't take a wire wheel to a combustion chamber, really, but I, my experience would tell, has already told me that this head was not going to be any good, so I just wanted to do it to show you all what it looks like when they crack. Another piece of scrap. A BMW with an overheating problem, likely from a failed cooling system component. No way, this must be the first. Actually, this is the second N20 or N26 I've torn down that had a cracked cylinder head, likely from overheating. This engine was overheated. The heat tab, that thing on the back of the cylinder head, the original one, was melted out, which tells me that engine got hot. And then for some reason, somebody sold it after that. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of these engines. I, 
I'm just not. I think these engines can be reliable if you maintain them, but compared to their predecessor, they do not tolerate the lack of proper maintenance and care. The N52 can tolerate all kinds of abuse. I'm not gonna tell you you can't kill them. I sell every single one that comes in, but an N20 is $4,000, $4,500, and there's far less of them available than a $1,200 to $1,500 N52. It just goes to show you that sometimes the latest and greatest, the newest model, isn't necessarily better. And I think that's definitely true for the BMW engines from this era. Now, this engine does have a few good parts. It's got a crankshaft I can sell. The rods and pistons might have some value. The oil pan, I sold all those parts from the last one I tore down and they did quite well. So I'll do well on this core, but the cracked head really stings. That's an expensive part. Unfortunately, it's not worth the time to fix and machine and try to resell it as good. Anytime a head's been hot enough to crack, even though you can machine it in every which way and you can make it right to the buyer, it's not as valuable. It just, it just isn't. And that's been my experience over the years. So if you'd like to buy any of the parts out of this engine, either for your desk or if you need it for your own N20 powered car, or if you need Miata parts, I have 22 of these things here. So many Miatas. I love it. Every bit of it. I'm gonna leave our email in the video description. You can also go to importapart.com and peruse our inventory. Check out all the parts cars I've been adding. I've got some pretty cool stuff in lately, an S2000, an LT4, C4 Corvette, just to name a few. I really hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.